Well, hello and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Um, I know that I have not been active for honestly well over a year, I think. Um, you might be able to hear my cat bathing herself right next to me, um, so apologies about that. Um, basically, I've just been very caught up with work and school, um, and now that I'm not working but now taking online courses, I don't know what my schedule will look like um, YouTube-wise, so you might get an upload once a month. You might get one once every couple months. I'm not sure. I think that I'm, you know, finally ready to, I guess, get back into posting true crime related stuff on YouTube. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to, if I haven't already, um, private a lot of my older videos just because I was 15 and I didn't know what I was doing and you know, looking back on it now, it's a little embarrassing. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sorry if you really loved my one makeup review that got like 10 views from three years ago. Uh, but, I mean, I have it. I'm not going to delete it, but um, I'm just gonna make it private. But anyways, all of that stuff aside, today I'm going to be talking about the very strange mystery surrounding the disappearance of David Glenn Lewis. But before I get into the case itself, I do want to say that I, by making this video, I mean absolutely no disrespect to David or any of his family members. Um, I just wanted to present this case to raise awareness and also because this case is very strange and I feel like it should be talked about more than it is. All of the information that I found regarding this video is just things that I found, you know, by googling and reading articles and watching YouTube videos. And so if there's anything inaccurate to the case, be sure to leave it in the comments so that I know. But anyways, I'm going to talk about the disappearance of David Glenn Lewis. On Super Bowl weekend of 1993, a Texan attorney disappeared for seemingly no reason at all. As of 2004, this case is technically solved, but strangely enough, the fact that it's solved only leads more questions unanswered. David Glenn Lewis was a 39-year-old man who lived in Dumas, I'm not sure if it's Dumas or Dumas, I don't know the exact pronunciation, I apologize, um, which is located in Texas, and he lived with his wife Karen and his then nine-year-old daughter. He practiced law in the nearby town of Amarillo, as well as being a night instructor at a college also located in Amarillo. The 1993 Super Bowl was held on the last weekend of January, uh, featuring the Dallas Cowboys and the Buffalo Bills. As you can imagine, a lot of Texans were incredibly excited about the fact that their team was going to be playing in the Super Bowl, David included, because he, according to reports, was a pretty big fan of the Cowboys. On January the 28th of 1993, David's wife Karen and their daughter went to Dallas for a weekend shopping trip while David stayed home with plans to watch the Super Bowl while they were gone. But as far as we know, that actually may not have happened. So Karen and her daughter came home late at night on January the 31st, three days being gone. They noticed that the light and their TV were both on and the dryer was on also with clothes inside, but David was nowhere to be found. After looking around, they discovered that he had left both his wedding band and his wristwatch on the kitchen counter, and they also found two freshly made turkey sandwiches left in their refrigerator. Their VCR was also on and had recorded the Super Bowl game. So off the bat, nothing super suspicious, so at first, Karen wasn't really worried. 
She probably thought that he had just left to go to a friend's house or maybe had some kind of work-related thing to take care of and that he would be home fairly soon. And so both her and her daughter went to bed. But David wasn't there the next morning, and he had had two appointments that day that he had missed, and when Karen found that out, that was when she really got nervous, and so naturally, she called the police. The Amarillo Police Department searched their house, but they found no evidence that indicated any kind of altercation or forced entry. So they told Karen that she needed to wait 24 hours after someone disappeared before reporting them missing for there to be any kind of investigation. Um, and I do want to put in here that as far as I know, uh, that's actually not true. Um, although for some reason, a lot of police departments do tell people that when they try to report someone missing. Um, it's actually not true. I don't know if it was true at the time that this occurred, but this is just to let you know that now, currently, across the United States, in most states, as far as I am aware, if a police officer tells you that you need to wait 24 hours uh, to report someone missing, that's actually absolutely not true. Um, the, four, the first 48 hours after somebody goes missing are the most important hours because those that is like the window of a time period where you could actually find that person still alive whereas after 40 hours have passed there's a far less chance that that is the case unless the person you know ran away of their own accord but karen did wait understandably so after a police officer had told her that i mean i'm sure most people would have done the same if they didn't know otherwise and again it might have been the case in texas in the 90s I am not sure. But when that 24 hours had passed and David was still not home, she filed a missing persons report. So the police began their investigation on the 1st of February and they came up with this particular timeline of events. So January the 28th, Karen and their daughter leave for Dallas. David left his work early that day saying he didn't feel well. After he left work, he used his credit card to buy some gas and then taught his usual night class at the Amarillo College, which ended around 10 p.m. On January the 29th, a church friend of David actually spotted him rushing through the Southwest Terminal at the Amarillo Airport, oddly not carrying any luggage. On January the 30th, David's neighbors reported seeing his car at the house that day and someone who we still don't know exactly who it was uh, deposited $5,000 in David and Karen's joint bank account. Some people have speculated that it was work-related, but personally, I'm not entirely sure if it was because if it was, I feel like it would say that it was his work instead of just an unknown person. So, I don't know. This is the last day that David was officially seen. Every other day that he is reported to have been seen are still accounts that can't fully be, you know, proven to be David. So keep that in mind as we go forward. On January the 31st, there were no confirmed sightings of David, but someone, presumably David, was in the house that day, turning on the VCR, putting clothes in the dryer, making the sandwiches, etc. And then of course, Karen and their daughter returned that night, and the next day, February the 1st, she reports him missing and the investigation begins. But also on February the 1st, a man, possibly David, was seen taking pictures of David's car parked outside of the Potter County Courts building, where it was later discovered the next day, February the 2nd. Also on February the 1st, a cab driver claimed that he saw a man, potentially David Lewis, uh, to the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. The driver said that the man paid him in cash and was holding a wad of $100 bills and appeared to be very nervous. So on February the 2nd, like I mentioned before, the police found David's car. 
It was parked outside of the Potter County Courts building in downtown Amarillo. His checkbook, credit card, and driver's license were found inside the car, as well as both his car keys and his house keys tucked underneath the floor mat of the car. And soon after, a few more details were uncovered. Two plane tickets were purchased by a David Lewis, one bought on January the 31st from Dallas to Amarillo, and the second one was bought on February the 1st and went from LA back to Dallas. This is quite strange to me. That means that he would have had to drive to Dallas or maybe take a plane to Dallas under a different name, fly from Dallas back to Amarillo, somehow get from Amarillo to LA, and then back to Dallas. It just doesn't make any sense. Unfortunately, at the time, in 1993, you didn't need an ID to buy a plane ticket, so it very well could have not been David in the first place, or if it was, they wouldn't be able to prove it. On the other hand, it could have been a totally different David Lewis that bought the plane tickets. I'm sure there are at least hundreds, if not thousands, of David Lewis's across the country, and probably plenty in Texas as well. It also can't be confirmed if the plane tickets were even used in the first place. And so, unfortunately, this lead doesn't really take the investigation anywhere. Karen also told the police a very important detail during this investigation, which was that David had received multiple death threats while he was serving as a judge from 1986 to 1990. And he had recently told her that he felt like his life was in danger. But unfortunately, he didn't tell her exactly why he felt that way. She also told investigators that David was supposed to fly out to Dallas the week after he vanished. He was supposed to be there for a deposition in a $3 million lawsuit, which was a conflict of interest lawsuit between his former law firm and a wealthy client. Eerily enough, David's files about the deposition disappeared after he did. He also was reported to say that he was going to tell the truth no matter who it hurt. But David's lawyer had said that the deposition wasn't serious enough to bring harm David's way. But I will say, it's very weird. Now, unfortunately, since the police couldn't find any evidence of foul play, and after almost a year of investigating, with almost no developments at this point, the Amarillo Special Crimes Unit canceled David's investigation and said that David was missing voluntarily. This left David's family, friends, and the entire community wondering where he was, why he left, and if he was still out there somewhere, maybe even living another life. But unbeknownst to anyone in Texas, David was dead, and he would not be identified for several years. So now we return to February the 1st, the same day that Karen reported David as being missing. On Route 24 near River Road in Yakima County, Washington, there was a hit and run incident that night around 10.30 p.m. Now, I've heard two different versions of this story, and I'm not sure which one is true. Some reports said that a motorist saw a man walking in the middle of the road on the two yellow lines. The driver passes the man and becomes worried for his safety, so they turn around to ask if he needs help, but saw that he had already been hit and spotted a Chevrolet Camaro driving away, and they call 911. Other reports say that the driver saw the man lying on the side of the road already, turned around to check on him, discovered he had been hit and was dead, saw the same car, Chevrolet Camaro, driving away, and called 911. The man that was hit 
had unfortunately passed away. The man was wearing camouflage military style clothes as well as work boots and had glasses on him but wasn't wearing them. I couldn't find out whether the glasses were in a pocket or if he was carrying them but either way he did have glasses but they weren't on his face. He had no kind of identification on him and so they obviously weren't able to identify him and tests showed that he was not intoxicated, he didn't have any drugs or alcohol in his system. As I'm sure as you have gleaned from the information that I'm talking about in this video, uh, this man was David Lewis and he remained unidentified for 11 years after his death. It was Washington State Police Detective Patrick Dutter who finally put the pieces together, however. He was inspired to take a closer look at Jane and John Doe cases after reading Without a Trace, which was an investigative series by the Seattle Post Intelligencer that showed how police frequently mishandle adult missing persons cases. So he began searching on Google for unidentified people in his area, going through all of the details, and came up with lists of possible victims of different Jane and John Doe cases going off of height, weight, hair and eye color, and other identifiable features. While doing so, he came across David's case, and he saw a striking resemblance between David and the hit-and-run victim. David also wore glasses, and the glasses that the hit-and-run victim was carrying were very similar to the glasses that David wore. So, Detective Ditter gave Amarillo Police Department a call, and he sent them a DNA sample, which was compared to David's mother's DNA, and it was match. So, after 11 years, David was finally identified as being the victim of a hit and run, and he had passed away the very same day that his wife had reported him missing. So, while the question of what happened to David is for the most part answered, it now leaves behind the question of what else happened to David, what led up to this point, and a lot of it is still very murky. David's wife, Karen, said that David never owned any military style clothing or the boots that he was found in. So where did he get those clothes? And how did he get to Washington in the first place? And why was he there? Karen also said that he had no connections to Washington, let alone Yakima County. So what was he doing? Either walking in the road or walking on the side of the road. The plane tickets that he might have purchased had absolutely nothing to do with Washington and they may have not even been used. Did he run away or was he kidnapped like his family believes? If he did leave on his own accord, did he have any plans of returning? Was the hit and run an accident or was it purposeful? There are so many unanswered questions in this case and while there are several theories, none of them can really fully explain the whole thing. His family believes that he was kidnapped, but other theories include him running away from potential danger, wanting to start a new life, and having some form of amnesia as well. I'm more inclined to believe that he was either kidnapped or that he purposefully disappeared due to some kind of danger, whether it was real or imaginary. I'm still 50-50 on whether he ran away from actual danger or if he perhaps suffered some from some kind of paranoia. I mean, since he was working as a judge and received multiple death threats, I feel like that would make you pretty paranoid. So it's possible that he had received more recently and he believed that somebody was truly after him. And maybe they were, but maybe they weren't. It's hard to tell. I think in cases like this, people really get lost in the mystery and the intrigue of it all. And I can't really blame them because it was very interesting to research and this case, even though it's tragic, it is very much 
shrouded in mystery and all of these questions and theories and it's easy to get lost in that but David's daughter had to grow up without her dad and she was only nine years old when he disappeared Karen and the rest of his family and all his friends had to just go on living for 11 years not knowing what happened to him or whether he was even still alive and even though now they know that he has passed away there's still so many questions left unanswered and I can't even imagine the kind of pain that that would cause not only you know the family but also just the community at large I mean from all accounts David was a very kind and caring and well-liked man and the overall loss of him and also the fact that no one really knows exactly what happened to him is just incredibly tragic anyways that is all that i could find on the disappearance of david glenn lewis i was not able to find a lot of articles on him i know that this case has kind of started popping up a lot more in unsolved crime and disappearance circles on youtube and i think on reddit as well um and other circles i'm sure also but there still wasn't a large amount of information that i could find and there was a lot of conflicting reports for example i don't I'm still, it's still unclear as to whether he was walking in the middle of the road or if he was already deceased when the person that found him found him. And it's also unclear as to whether the VCR that had taped the Super Bowl was an automatic one or a manual one. So that has led people to wonder if David was even in the house on the 31st that I don't know. If he was at the house that day, that means that he would have had to have walked back to his house after already parking his car at a different location. And so that's also very strange. So if there were any details that I missed or anything important that I didn't glean from this case, then please leave it in the comments below. Also remember that if you're going to comment any theories or speculation to just remember to be respectful. And I guess that's all that I have to say for now. <sighs> Leave a like if you enjoyed this video and subscribe if you enjoy this kind of content. I try to keep it relatively chill so if that's something that you enjoy then you can subscribe if you want to. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it. I'll see you guys later.